Hey guys, I just feel like making a random video, just talking, just going over some scriptures, and uh, just speaking some ideas, and maybe questions that I might have myself as I'm reading, but also a brother wrote to me recently, and we were talking about some things, about uh, the transcendence of God, and how God is far above us, and uh, how foolish it is for us to uh, compare you know, God to us, or you know, to bring Him to our level. And uh, there's that verse in scripture where uh, it's in Psalms, and it says, uh, God said, something like you thought I was such a one as you are, or something like that. God basically says, you know, it basically says, you know, you thought that you were like God, or whatever. Um, anyway... And then uh, the brother said something about anthropomorphic language, how, you know, the Bible speaks of God having hands and stuff. And, um, you know, I don't think that that language brings God to our level. I think that language is to help us to understand God because God surpasses, you know, our uh, ability to understand, you know, who he is exactly. We can only understand uh, about God, what he has revealed to us through the scriptures, through his spirit, and those are ways to help us understand God, not to bring him to our level, so it doesn't in any way lower God, and I don't think there's any reason to take the, the anthropomorphic language literally to say that, you know, God has a hand, or whatever God, or that God has wings, you know, God is a spirit, and again, it's it's beyond our comprehension to understand him. But, also, a uh, brother mentioned something about how it mentions that Jesus is at the right hand of God in Scripture, and that people uh, don't take that literally. Well, I don't take that literally, and I think I may have said that before, but I think that it's just symbolic, figurative language. And it means, uh, you know, it could be it could be a reference to, you know, when somebody sat at the right hand of the king or something uh, back then, uh, something that's a language that they would understand. And it basically means that Jesus has the same authority as the Father, or the Father has given Jesus the, the authority. And basically, that language, Jesus being at the right hand of God, he, has, he can judge. Um, God gave him the right to judge. And he has the same authority again. Uh, so it's basically making Jesus equal with God. So, you know, the Jews at the time would have rejected that idea that Jesus was equal in authority with the Father, that he's at the right hand of God. So I don't think there's any reason for us to, uh, you know, take literally, you know, a throne in heaven or anything. We really don't know what it's like. We can't comprehend that. But I don't think that that's what the language of Scripture is trying to convey, even though it's easy for us to get that mental image I think that it's more of the idea and the symbolism that we're trying that the that this God through the scriptures wants us to to get out of that is that you know Jesus has equal authority with the Father. Jesus is deity. Jesus is God. That's what I think Scripture is trying to say to us. Not that there's a literal throne in heaven, you know, and um, there's I think there's less meaning to take it literally. You're, I think you're kind of missing the idea. But I thought I'd just pick something random, and it probably isn't random, so I probably went over it before, but this is First Peter chapter 1. Or, no, it's Philippians. Never mind. It's not. I was looking at First Peter. But this is Philippians, and using the E sword here, you see how it separates verses into groups here, uh, which is kind of helpful. And... So it says at the beginning is the greeting, the first two verses. It says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. So they say there are bishops and deacons there. Uh, I guess the elders of the church, the servants... Paul and Timotheus, uh, Timothy, reference to themselves as servants. They are servants of Jesus Christ. A 
That's what all Christians are. Um, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. So they call other believers saints. It doesn't say to all the sinners in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. And, you know, the, the language, you know, we see this all throughout Scripture where it says to all the saints in Christ Jesus. And so it's kind of baffling. You know, what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Uh, so, you know, all the saints who are Christians, who are, you know, they follow the faith of Jesus, they believe Jesus is God, uh, they believe that he died for their sins. Those are the ones who are in Christ Jesus, figuratively speaking, not inside his body or something like that, literally, this is figurative. So, uh, anyways, it says, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so, I think we see there are two distinct persons, the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so, thanksgiving and prayer. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy. Always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy. I thank my God every remembrance of you. So he reflects upon thanks about the people that he met. You know, we should all you know pray for others, pray for our brothers and sisters, be thanking of them. Um, he thanks God for them, for meeting them, for knowing them, and uh, he, he makes requests for them. Uh, you know, praise for their well-being and uh, strength for them and so forth. Uh, for your fellowship in the, in the gospel, again, it's in the gospel, what does that mean? You know, for your laboring with us in spreading the gospel, you know, for, uh, from the first day until now, uh, or for your fellowship with us, you know, as believers in the gospel, as believers, uh, we share that fellowship uh, because we believe in the gospel. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And this verse is used for eternal security a lot, and I think it's a good one that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, what exactly does that mean? I think that he is speaking of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, or, or God in general. Uh, he hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Basically, that you know, God is with us until we're going to meet Jesus, and uh, you know, those who have believed in the gospel, God does not forsake, and uh, continues with us in our everyday Christian walk. So, anyways, I think it's a good verse for uh, eternal security. Uh, you know, you don't see things like He which hath begun a good work in you. Uh, you know, might perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, unless, you know, whatever. <laughs> no, it seems like a certainty, a certainty of a hope that believers can have. And, uh, you know, and also the fact that he begun a good work, so it's really the Lord who does the work, not meaning that we don't have a choice to accept or reject the gospel, but we cannot be saved apart from, you know, what Christ did. And, um, so it's Christ who saves, <clears throat> but we must choose to accept that salvation. But it is, it's he's, you know, God begun the good work. Even as it is meet for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as, and again, you know, I have you in my heart. Does it mean they're in his literal heart? No. But he means that, you know, he's thinking of them. It's, it's, you know, 
his person, his uh, his his conscience, you know, and his mind. He's thinking of them. Uh, you know, it's like a like a strong connection there in his heart. Uh, and as much as both of, in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. Um, it's defense. And it's interesting too that he says in the defense, same confirmation of the gospel. So he's defending the gospel. So I guess that would be kind of a good verse for people who say, you know, there shouldn't be any kind of apologetics or there shouldn't be any kind of, you know, defending doctrine or rebuking false doctrine or whatever. Uh, you know, we see plenty of verses that say otherwise, but I mean, this does talk about the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Um, you are all partakers of my grace. Uh, so again, I'm not really sure exactly how to interpret that, but I mean, he's talking about praying for them and stuff, thanking of them, and so maybe that's how he's saying you're partakers of my grace. For God is my record, uh, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And again, in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Is that in the literal bowels of Jesus Christ? No. Um, so he's saying God is his witness God knows his thoughts God knows his heart and uh, his heart truly longs for the brothers and sisters in Christ those are the ones who are in the bowels of Jesus Christ they are the saints in Jesus Christ um, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment Prays that their love may abound more and more in knowledge. In knowledge and judgment. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Um, so talks about knowledge and judgment and then he goes on to say you know approving the things that are excellent uh, the things that are right by God that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Jesus Christ again tell tell we meet the Lord uh, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ so, you know, the fruits of righteousness come from Jesus. They come from God. Uh, unto the glory and praise of God. So, I don't really know what else to say to that. You know, I could look into that a lot deeper. But just going off the top of my mind, what I can think about. Let's continue on. The advance of the gospel. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So him being in bounds, and I think he's speaking of, you know, the persecution and stuff have actually worked out for the better of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. My bonds in Christ. He's meaning his persecution because of his faith in Christ is what he's saying. And many of the brethren in the Lord, in this, in that, you see, you know, brethren in the Lord, you know. So, speaking of brethren, but to even be more specific, he's saying, in the Lord, and, you know, who is the Lord? Jesus Christ. My Christian brethren. Uh, you know, and it could be brethren uh, by, by relation, like, you know, Jews. He could have called Jews brethren or whatever, but this is specific. He's saying, you know, my brethren in the Lord. We're talking about Jews and Gentiles, believers in Christ. So, waxing confident by my bonds, and much more bold to speak the word without fear. Uh, 
And so uh, I think that he's saying many of the brethren, he's saying, you know, because of my bonds in Christ, it's spreading the gospel. And also many brethren are confident in his bonds and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So I think they're saying, okay, you know, look at all the stuff that Paul is going through. And, uh, you know, if, you know, he's this dedicated to, you know, serving the Lord, and he's suffering because of it and stuff, you know, it gives us, you know, the strength to, to go through it too, to look at, you know, what other people have done. And, you know, you see somebody else that's standing up for something right, and you want to, and um, so he's, it's giving encouragement to other believers. Um, you know, it's doing the opposite effect of what people would want, you know, non-believers. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. And so, uh, you know, that's something I'd want to look more into in that verse, what the thoughts are on that. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, um, but some of goodwill. So what does it mean that some preach Christ of envy and strife? That's an interesting one. Um, obviously, goodwill, I mean, wanting to get people saved, I guess envy and strife kind of isn't really the, <laughs> they're not really doing it out of the right, you know, mindset, uh, but they're still doing it. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Hmm. So, how are some preaching Christ uh, to add affliction to his bonds? I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting section there. Uh, but, I'm just going to continue on to this last part here. To live as Christ... What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached? And therein I, and therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. And so, the end of the idea here anyways is that, you know, either way, the gospel is being preached, and he is uh, rejoicing in his bonds, that it is so. And for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And, uh, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. And so when I think he's talking about the shall turn my salvation through prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, I don't think he's talking about spirit, the salvation of the soul, but rather, uh, you know, he, I'm sure he's confident already in his salvation, and it's not that somebody else's prayer is what gets us saved, but you know, in his uh, present day life, um, that he will have peace and uh, joy and, um, you know, basically saving the state of his mind and, uh, you know, that's what I'm thinking of. According to my earnest expectation, I hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. I already read that. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's a hugely popular verse among us believers, right? That's one of those verses that you memorize. Philippians 1, 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This is what Paul said, you know, in persecution, and that's the same kind of mindset that we should have, um, 
you know, we live, then we continue to serve Christ and, uh, you know, spread the kingdom and uh, to die, you know, we go to be with Christ. And so, it's really a win-win situation for us either way, isn't it? But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose, I what not. I thought that was interesting, funny. I what not. W-O-T. I think it means I know not. Uh, and we can kind of understand that from continuing reading. For I am in a strait betwixt two. Betwixt is interesting too. Kind of makes you think of like the Twix candy bar or something. I'm a strait between the two. I'm you know, I'm stuck between these two ideas, you know, continuing to live and serve the Lord or to just, you know, to go to be with the Lord. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And it's another interesting thing where people teach soul sleep and whatever and that, you know, believers don't go to heaven when they die. They go wherever or they don't go wherever. But there's verses like this, obviously, where Paul says that, you know, if he departs from his body, that he's going to be with Christ. And he's very confident of that. And, uh, you know, we can understand that that's the same for all believers. Uh, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. It's an evident token of perdition. Nothing. Do not be terrified of your adversaries. Um, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, uh, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. In him, again. I <laughs> have to make mention of that. Um, and so, again, you know, we read over and over again about the suffering of believers, you know, for Jesus Christ. And at some places and at some times in history, far worse than, you know, some of us may have it today. But obviously the body does, or the Bible does talk about, you know, the world hating you because they first hated Jesus because you know, they hate God so they're going to hate his followers but that's just uh, going over this so thanks for watching like your hear your ideas what you think God bless